Sorry again, we are not hearing you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Let me get back into the screen here and uh, hopefully get rid of this thing. No, it's not the wrong thing. There we go. Okay. So, so um, an outline of what I'm going to talk about is why the interest in magnesium aluminum, uh, phase diagonal and phase transformations, uh, defects in their effects on the magnetic behavior. Then I'm going to talk about particulates, book magnets, a little bit about alloy, and then some conclusions. So uh, um, this is the crystal structure for magnesium aluminum. It's a tetragonal crystal structure where you have uh, magnesium atom in the center of the unit cell. Now, if you put manganese atoms next to each other, um, manganese has a large magnetic moment, but the magnetic moments line up anti-parallel when uh, magnesium atoms are adjacent. But in a crystal structure like this, if you put an aluminum atom between those manganese, the manganese atoms now line up, uh, the magnetic moments line up in the same direction. Um, one thing is if you, uh, the manganese aluminum exists over a range of compositions, and if you're manganese rich, then the excess manganese, of course, sits on the aluminum sites, and those atoms will, will line up with magnetic moments that are anti parallel, so reduce the saturation magnetization. So, why the interest in manganese aluminum? Well, if you look at the cost of, of permanent magnets, they range from ferrites, which are the cheap uh, magnets on the market, and actually uh, uh, are about 95% of the actual volume uh, of the market. Um, and the other end of the sale, uh, scale, are the rare earth magnets, which are much more expensive and actually in terms of value, almost half the value of the market. Um, in between, there's alni codes, which were invented in the 1940s. And here I've estimated the cost of, of clown magnets aluminum, used, assuming some uh, powder processing route and then um, compaction, but then that's uh, just a guess really. Um, but if we look at the, the properties of magnets, when you're looking at the permanent magnet, the uh, parameter of interest is BH max, the energy product. The, um, and again, there's a, there's a range. So the, the, the worst magnets, the ferrites, which have a value in this parameter in MGOE of 4.5. And at the other end of the scale, there's a near ion near boron, which has an energy product 10 times greater than that of ferrites. And there's a, there's a sort of gap in between here. And this is where um, uh, tau manganese aluminum could sit. So theoretically, it would have a, uh, it has a potential value of 12, um, but the best anybody's done so far is actually seven. Interestingly, if you take the, the uh, energy product and divide it by the density, so you have a density compensated energy product, you can see the tau magnesium aluminum actually does um, uh, quite well compared to, uh, even better compared to some of these other materials. But if you look at the, the cost per, per unit energy product, you can see that for the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the theoretical value of tau magnesium aluminum, then uh, it actually has the lowest cost of any magnet. Um, currently, though, it, it's actually a little bit worse than ferrites because we never reached that value. So if you look at the phase diagram, uh, this is the magnesium aluminum phase diagram or the central portion of it. At high temperature, we have this phase uh, epsilon, which is hexagonal. And if you very, very slowly cool down or cool down to low temperature and hold the material at um, uh, some intermediate temperature here for a while, you'll get to the equilibrium phases, which are gamma two, which is this trigonal structure, and beta manganese, which is this uh, complex cubic structure here. However, if you, if you cool not too slowly or you quench and then re anneal in the range 400 to 700 degrees C, this, this phase tau magnesium aluminum uh, uh, is, is produced, uh, the tetragonal phase here. Um, of course, if you anneal for very long times at, at intermediate temperatures, you'll get back to the, the equilibrium phases. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, um, possibly. Uh, some people have suggested that the epsilon doesn't simply transform to tau, but there's actually an ordering reaction from the hexagonal phase that transforms into this ordered phase, which is now a rhombic 
and that the order phase um, then undergoes a Martin Zutik shear into the tau phase. Um, this is still a little bit contentious. Um, there's, there's, there's a little bit of evidence for that, though. Um, this is some work by Gain uh, and co-workers where they looked at uh, four different compositions of manganese aluminum, and you can group them into two parts. The, the ones that have um, manganese less than 55% and those of greater than 55%. So for the, for the low manganese ones, um, this is a, a differential scanning, scanning calorimeter curve. You can see this, this low temperature peak here, um, which is the, the author suggested the change from epsilon to this epsilon dash, this ordering transformation. And then as you continue to heat the material, um, you then transform to the tau phase, which is this peak over here. For higher uh, manganese contents, you don't see these low temperature peaks and the material actually simply transforms to the equilibrium uh, phases in the material. Um, we've actually done uh, a little bit of work on this as well. This is simply for uh, manganese 54, aluminum 46. And you can see in this case, in this calorimetry curve, um, this, this low temperature peak is a little bit more prominent. And um, there's a, um, it's not quite clear whether this, this low temperature peak is really this epsilon to epsilon dash tra audience transformation or it's epsilon to, to tau by shear transformation. Um, there's been two different suggestions about what this art is. But at high temperature, again, you get this peak, um, uh, which is either the epsilon or the epsilon prime plus epsilon tra transform into the tau phase by a diffusional transformation. Uh, here's some um, images showing this transformation. The left is an, uh, an optical micrograph, the one, is, the one on the right is a transmission electron micrograph. And in both cases, you can see that the tau phase actually transforms from the grain boundaries, so it nucleates from the grain boundaries and grows out in particular directions into the matrix and the material. Now, the interesting thing about the uh, transformation from the high temperature phase to the uh, tau phase we're interested in, it actually produces lots of defects. And it's not quite clear what all of those defects do. So the first type of those is these macro twins here that you can see in this optical micrograph. And in addition to that, you get micro twins seen in this transmission electron micrograph, these very fine features here, the micro twins in the material uh, from two um, different pieces of work here. Um, there's been some uh, interesting atom probe tomography work recently on across twins in manganese aluminum by uh, a group at Max Planck Institute in Dusseldorf. And they actually show that there's a manganese enrichment actually at the twin and a reduction in aluminum right at the twin. So what that means, if the manganese actually sits um, on the aluminum sites at the twin there, then there's, um, there's going to be a reduction in the saturation magnetization in the material. Um, in fact, you can see uh, the effects of uh, of twins in, in this, this data here, which is very recent data by Gio et al. The, the, the figure on the left is from uh, what they refer to as a twin-free material, and the one on the right is a very heavily twinned material. And the two features, um, they measured the material in two different orientations. If we just look at the red orientation here, you can see the twin-free um, twin material has a high magnetic remnants here and a high coercivity. Um, whereas the twin material has a, a lower magnetic remnant at this point where it crosses the axis and a lower coercivity. And the values are listed down here. And you can see the twin free material has about twice the coercivity of the twin material and the, the magnetic reson resonance to the uh, remnants to the magnetic saturation is actually uh, much lower in the twin material as well. Um, the transformation also produces dislocations and stacking faults. And you can see that here, there's lots of dislocations in this material after transformation, and then also a number of stacking faults. Um, these stacking faults are actually generated by the glide of these uh, 1 over X, 1, 1, 2 shocky partials. But currently it's not clear whether this X in this uh, uh, Burgers vector is one third or one sixth. That is whether these are super shockers or simply shocky partials in the material. However, dislocations are known to affect the magnetic properties. So this is some data from um, um, Bittner uh, et al. Where you can, you can see the uh, cold work material has a coercivity uh, like this and a saturation magnetization here. They then anneal the material to remove the dislocations and you can see the coercivity decreases, but the saturation magnetization goes up. 
This is very recent work by Gia et al, where they also looked at the effect of dislocations. Instead of plotting the actual value of the dislocations, they plotted the percentage of dislocations. So this is 100% dislocations after they've informed it. And then as they anneal the material, the, the dislocation density goes down, shown by this green curve. And you can see as the density goes down, the coercivity also decreases, but the saturation magnetization actually increases as well. So um, dislocations have quite a significant effect. And in general, of course, in magnetic materials, the coercivity is roughly proportional to the dislocation density to one half. Um, the transformation also produces thermal antiphase boundaries, uh, uh, as uh, shown here. Um, and uh, with thermal antiphase boundaries, because there's a, a mismatch in the interface, then you also again have manganese atoms sitting next to manganese atoms. Um, and so you'll have some anti-ferromagnetic behavior there, reducing the saturation magnetization. Um, but at this point, it's not quite clear what these do in terms of the uh, coercivity. Um, one suggestion is that the, uh, the, the thermal antiphase boundaries may reduce the coercivity due to easy nucleation of the uh, magnetic domains. Um, an alternative paper suggests they actually pin the domain walls because they reduce the, um, there's a reduction in domain wall energy there. Um, in Interesting, these two different suggestions were actually uh, made by the same group, but in two different papers. Um, one thing that hasn't been seen in uh, magnesium lunum, but probably exists in the material, is interphase boundary tubes. So interphase boundary tubes were first suggested in 1962 by Vidal and Brown, and these actually are produced when you have pairs of APB coupled dislocations gliding and they intersect another pair of APB coupled dislocations such that there's a, the jobs that are produced on those uh, gliding dislocations are no, no longer aligned. So as the dislocation moves forward, it then, it then drags out this APB tube behind it. And you can see an example from some work of our own for APB tubes in uh, iron aluminum here, and there's a little model of what it looks like here. So these haven't been observed in manganese aluminum, but since the dislocation of manganese aluminum, uh, and undoubtedly uh, coupled by um, an antiphase boundary, it's very likely that they occur. So turning to the processing, so I'm going to give you a little bit of work we've done on the process and then compare it to um, what other people have found. So we made the manganese aluminum a variety of different ways. One was by uh, gas atomization. You can see the gas atomized um, particles that we've got here, which are, which are um, largely spherical particles. Um, we then also took these and mechanically milled them as well. So this is in the epsilon state, and you can see there's a change in particle shape and um, size a little bit after the mechanical milling. Um, this, these are transmission electromicrographs. So this is before milling, when we've got the epsilon phase, and you can just see a refraction pattern here from that. After the mechanical milling, um, you've got this really fine microstructure and the diffraction pattern shows the ring pattern because we've got numerous grains. And from X-ray diffraction, we ended up with a grain size of about 16 nanometers in this material. Then if you um, run that material through a differential scanning calorimeter and compare it to bulk material, this is what you get. So this is a mechanically milled material. This is the bulk material. And you can see that the mechanically milled material has a lower transformation temperature and a larger energy associated with the transformation. Um, the lower energy, the lower temperature is because the, um, the transformation occurs at grain boundaries and there's many more grain boundaries in the um, Also shown here is the effect of carbon. Um, and carbon also lowers the transformation temperature a little bit compared to um, uh, the bulk material. So this is some um, uh, cast material that was broken up and then mechanically milled and, and then annealed to, to go from the epsilon phase, which is the cast phase, to the tau phase. And these, this is um, uh, X-ray diffraction data at increasing temperature, and down the bottom is for bulk material. If I start out at the bulk material, first of all, you can see this is a, five, a 10 minute anneal at 500 degrees C, and it largely transformed to the, to the tau phase in the material. Um, by comparison, if you look at the uh, uh, mechanical mill material, a low temperature, you've got mostly tau phase, but there's also a little bit of beta and the gamma two produced. As you increase the annealing temperature, you actually get less um, tau phase produced um, and more of the equilibrium phase. But interestingly, while doing that, if you look at the peak ratios, you find that the tau is actually slightly more ordered as you go to higher temperatures. So there's a, there's a bit of a trade-off between 
having less tau in the material and, and having it more ordered, so a more magnetic. Um, this is uh, this shows the uh, results for uh, material. There was two two materials: a bulk material, the mechanical milled material, um, annealed at their optimum annealing conditions. And you can see the effect of the mechanical milling um, is actually to reduce the saturation magnetization. It actually significantly increases the the uh, coercivity in the material. And that coercivity increase is probably not due to fine grain size. It's probably due to the fact that you've got these. Uh, beta and gamma two precipitates that are pinning the main walls. Um, this actually shows the, um, the the saturation magnetization on the left axis and the coercivity on the right axis for bulk material and mechanical milled material. And there's a number of things I want to point out. One is that the optimum anneal to get the best magnetic properties is actually at a lower temperature for mechanical milled material because the transformation is faster. If you look at the saturation magnetization, these two scales are different uh, on the left. The, 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 the best saturation magnetization you get from mechanical mill is not as good as the bulk material. But if you look at the coercivity, and again, these two scales aren't the same, the, the best uh, coercivity we get from mechanical mill is far above that for the, um, the uh, bulk material. And in fact, here's the um, data for gas atomized powders where we've taken those powders and simply anneal them and, and measure the magnetic properties and we get this is to reach this loop. And this is when we've, we've taken those gas atomized powders, mechanically milled them, so they got a very fine grain size and then annealed them in the optimal conditions. And you can see uh, in this particular case, we've got um, essentially the same saturation magnetization, but a much larger coercivity in the material. So this is a bit of an eye chart for you to look at, um, but um, there've been many, uh, workers who produce particulates of manganese aluminum, and they've used a variety of different methods. So gas atomization, mechanical milling, mechanical alloying, melt spinning, spark erosion, and then you have to uh, give them heat treatment after that. And sometimes some, some papers have actually combined these. So for instance, melt spinning, followed by uh, mechanical milling, and then heat treatment. Um, what I want to point out from this is that if you look at all this work that's been done, the people who've got the highest uh, coercivity are not the same uh, as the rows who've got the highest saturation magnetization and are not the same as those uh, uh, results from the highest uh, energy product. In fact, the highest energy product for particulates was uh, obtained by my group in, in 2006, and I think it's still probably the highest. Um, this, this graph uh, replots that data um, as the coercivity as a function of saturation magnetization, and the color code in here is for the different um, processing methods. And actually what I want to point out from this is if you look at all these different processing methods, um, none of them seem to be the optimal. For instance, the, the, the light blue here is melt spinning and you can get values all over this graph. You actually want to be up in this right hand corner here to have the highest coercivity and highest saturation magnetization. But if you look at this, there's, there's no obvious route that's better than any other route. Um, People have also done bulk processing as have we, and again, they use these different methods to produce particulates in some cases, and then use various methods to compact them, either cold isostatic pressing or hot compaction. In some cases, material is simply cast um, uh, and, and heat treated, or sometimes it's uh, extruded as well. So hot extrusion followed by heat treatment. And again, the thing I wanted to point out is that the, 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 the work that produced the highest saturation and magnetization is, is not the same as the ones that produce the highest coercivity and the max. So again, the, the optimum process has not really been figured out yet. Um, this actually summarizes the best um, coercivity, saturation, magnetization, and energy product values for both particulates and bulk material. And again, you can see the best value for the um, the saturation magnetization is actually in a particulate um, uh, material, as, as is the, the, the best value for the coercivity, but actually the highest value for BH max is actually in a bulk material. So um, there's been a number of pieces of work on adding ternary elements to uh, manganese aluminum, just on a throw something in, let's see what happened basis. Um, we've decided to do some first principles calculations on, on this and, and looked at putting different elements actually on the antiphase boundary and what that would do to the energy 
uh, of the antiphase boundary. And, and what we found was that these elements that are shown here in red actually decrease the energy of the boundary. So you'd expect the, the, um, those elements to actually uh, segregate the, the um, anti-phase anti, um, boundaries in the material. Um, and so what we did was we took one of these materials, and we're going to look at some of those later, but um, we took one of these titanium and put it in manganese aluminum to, to see what happens. This is the, the graph that you saw earlier. This is the when we put just 1% titanium replacing manganese in the material. Um, and if you look at the two graphs, these the low temperature peaks are, are essentially at the same temperature uh, in the material, in fact, identically at the same temperature. Um, this is the low temperature transformation, which we're not quite sure happens. But the high temperature transformation, where we get this diffusional transformation of epsilon to tau, is actually shifted by nearly 50 degrees by adding simply 1% titanium. Um, we've, we've since added 2% titanium to this, and that actually shifts it by another 50 degrees higher. So that's really surprising result for such a small amount of titanium. Actually, if we look at the magnetic properties, the, I apologize, the two scales are slightly different here, but the magnetic properties are actually not terribly different from when we've added uh, titanium to the but the transformation kinetics are. So I just want to uh, conclude by uh, saying that um, the, there have been lots of different ways of processing manganese aluminum, and the, the highest uh, coercivity I've obtained is this 5.3 uh, kilo ersteds, which was produced by melt spinning plus mechanical milling followed by heat treatment. And, and a different work, the highest saturation magnetization was obtained at 127 EMU per gram, which was developed simply by melt spinning and heat treating. And the highest energy product um, was obtained by hot extrusion plus heat treatment. But even this best value that anybody's obtained so far is actually below the theoretical value. Um, so our, our work now is uh, looking at how we're going to uh, obtain the optimal conditions to process the material um, and figure out what the role of these defects are so that we can understand whether it's good to have more of the defects or less of the defects. And if anybody wants to, to know more about this material, um, uh, Thomas Keller, my graduate student and I, have just published a paper, Manganese-Based Permanent Magnets um, in Progress in Material Science. And if you're interested, you can also email me at ian.baker at dartmouth.edu. Yeah, thank you.